Okay, it's Philip Lee returning with uh, another episode of Civil War Chat. Today is Wednesday, the 28th of October, 2020. There's going to be two topics today. One is to ask, you know, whether you would have uh, opposed slavery if you had lived in the 1850s or 1860s. And number two is I watched a YouTube presentation by uh, three uh, professors, uh, Bruce Levine of uh, University of uh, Illinois, uh, Elizabeth Barron of the University of Virginia, and Mark Egnall of York University in Canada. They all made presentations on, on the causes of the Civil War. This was actually a video done about five years ago, uh, but I want to comment on, on some of the things I said. I'll put a link down below to their presentation. It goes, I think, for about an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. But you'll, you'll hear all three of them, and there'll be a question and answer period with the audience. So first, what I'd like to begin with is um, I found it interesting, a uh, professor at Princeton University by the name of Robert George had challenged his students, uh, all of his students, uh, he said, uh, nearly all of them, and said that they would have opposed slavery if they had lived in the 19th century. If they had lived in the antebellum era, era they would have opposed slavery. So uh, he decided to attest them. So uh, according, according to him, nearly all of his students declared that they would have been abolitionists, had they li even if they had lived in the South in the antebellum period, particularly the late 1850s. But he shows that only the tiniest fraction of them, or perhaps probably any of us, would have spoken out against slavery or lifted a finger to free the slaves. Most of the students and us would probably have gone along with uh, the existing uh, practice, particularly if we'd lived in the South. Many would have even supported the slave system and happily benefited from it. Now here's how he makes his points. He tells his students who claim that they would have been abolitionists that he will credit their abolitionist claims if they can show that in leading their present lives in the year 2020, they have stood up for the rights of unpopular victims of injustice and where they have done so knowing one, they would be loathed and ridiculed by powerful individuals and institutions in our society. Two, they would be abandoned by many of their friends. And three, they would be shouted down with vile names. And four, that they would be not denied valuable professional opportunities as a result of their moral witnessing. And five, they might even lose their jobs after such witnessing. Now, those people that are demonstrating to remove statues, uh, they don't have this problem because that is a popular stance. But an unpopular stance, would they, the question is, will the students actually stand up for an unpopular uh, person? Uh, espousing an unpopular opinion. In short, he challenged his students to show where they have, at the risk to themselves and their futures, stood up for a cause that is unpopular within the elite sectors of today's society. It's a revealing challenge to the students and, and it would be even more illuminating if applied to academic historians. And it evokes the ancient wisdom, quote, courage is the rarest of victims. Obviously, what he discovered is that once he put those conditions to his students, he, the students realized they probably would not have stood up in defense of an unpopular opinion. I mean, for example, the uh, Ann Coulter, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, Ben Shapiro, all conservative political uh, advocates have been shouted down and re refused by mobs, mobs of students, have refused them an opportunity to speak at a number of different universities, including Stanford, um, 
many others, but I mean, Stanford is, is, is a good enough example. What's interesting is, uh, I think it's David Cole and Ann Coulter. David Cole writes for Ataki magazine online. Both of them were presenting to one of the uh, universities in Southern California at different times. And the, the schools backed away. They, they, they permitted them to come, but they backed away from providing any type of uh, security. Uh, told their, their police forces to stand down. And uh, the mobs nearly, uh, you know, nearly caused physical harm to them. The only people since the police would not stand up because they were told not to, the only people that protected them, Ann Coulter has said this, were the Proud Boys. Now, I don't know much about the Proud Boys, but I was quite interested to hear that. So I looked into them a little bit, especially after one of the, uh, 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 the you know, in, during the presidential debate, I, I can't remember who it was. Yeah, it was Chris Wallace. He asked President Trump, he said, you know, you, um, will you denounce the Proud Boys? Uh, I didn't know much about them. Uh, but when I looked into it, what I found is that the uh, fellow that runs it is uh, Hispanic, that they have black members, and that they really see themselves as a, uh, essentially patriotic organization. And I, I think it's a stretch requiring a bungee cord to claim that the Proud Boys have been the principal uh, source of the uh, rioting and looting and all the so-called the with euphemism uh, civil unrest in our cities during this past summer and up to the present. I mean, even yesterday, I think in Philadelphia or the day before. Um, Brad boys aren't haven't been the source of all that violence. And as I say, they were the only ones that would defend Ann Coulter and David Cole. And of course, also Milo Yiannopoulos has been run out, and and uh, Ben Shapiro has uh, had to be you know escorted out uh, because uh, students uh, wouldn't let them speak. I mean, it's just plain censorship. Another example, I think, is the uh, Gettysburg uh, uh, field guides. Uh, they're licensed; they have to go take a lot of tests. So if you go to Gettysburg and you want to, you know have a guide take you around the battlefield and show you where different things happen. And particularly if you have family members, uh, you know, ancestors that were there and you would like to know where was, uh, where was uh, your ancestor uh, on day one, day two, and day three, uh, the uh, Gettysburg guides can show you. So when the Gettysburg guides learned that the House of Representatives had passed a bill that would remove all Confederate monuments and memorials from all national battlefield parks, they put out a press release uh, to alert people that uh, this could actually happen. The bill is presently in the Senate. And so they were essentially encouraging uh, us to write our senators and get them to uh, uh, vote against the Senate bill so it wouldn't become an act. But the interesting thing to me is that uh, while I support them in that effort to keep the Confederate memorials on the National Battlefield Parks, I I'm really disappointed that they don't uh, support Confederate memorials anywhere else. Uh, and it, it appears to me it's hard to avoid that their prime motivation is self-serving. They know that if the Confederate memorials are taken off the battlefield parks, that uh, people with Southern ancestors are much less likely to attend so that their business will go on. You know, the the, the uh, number of people that will hire them to be escorted around the battlefield will, will, will decline. They'll make less money. They could speak out, at, you know, especially during the summer when we had mob destruction of Confederate memorials, they could have, they could have uh, said, you know, this is wrong, but they, they didn't. And once again, underscoring the point that courage is the rarest of virtues. And the same really applies to almost all of the Civil War historians. I, I don't know of any uh, Civil War historian that has, you know, criticized that. Or, or criticized, maybe some have come out, and I don't even know, that I can't point to it, I wouldn't be surprised if some have spoken out against the mob destruction, but I, I can't think of any that have spoken out against the uh, removal of the statues uh, if, if it's taken through a, a process of a vote by a, by a commission of uh, 
uh, uh, city uh, uh, governor, uh, uh, city administrators, or or county uh, county commissioners, that sort of thing. And, 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 it's particularly uh, discouraging because it's, it's pretty clear that a lot of the movement to get that done is being financed by people that are outside. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center has a lot of money and now you've got the $250 million that the Andrew Mellon Foundation says they're gonna put into this sort of thing. Uh, Mayor Stoney of Richmond has said that uh, uh, when he's criticized that this is going to come, you know, removing all those statues from Monument Avenue is going to cost the city a lot of money. He just said, no, don't worry about it. I don't get donations. And he's probably right. That really, um, that really doesn't level the playing field when it comes to determining what should happen to these monuments. But if the Gettysburg Guides and some of the histori uh, academic historians have stood up for this, then I think we would see a different result. So I, I uh, yeah, <laughs> I would like. I would love to see the uh, academic historians take this test that uh, Professor Robert George at Princeton is asking of his students. Would you? Do you now have the courage to stand up for an unpopular opinion, knowing that you'd be ridiculed if you did so? abandoned by your friends, shouted down with vile names, denied valuable professional opportunities, and even possibly lose your jobs? Well, no, they won't do it. Now, the second thing I wanted to get to is the uh, presentations that I saw by Bruce Levine, uh, Elizabeth Varon, and Mark Egnall. Mark Egnall of U York University was making a case that there, were, that there was an economic uh, side to uh, the explanations for the causes of the Civil War. Levine and Varon were insistent that uh, no, no, it was all it was all about slavery. And uh, Levine uh, even uh, rudely snatched a microphone away from Mark uh, Mark Agnell as he was winding up uh, in answering a question about the economic side of the war. Uh, she just hurriedly wanted to step in and say that no, no, no. It was all the Southerners were all bad people, and uh, they were bigots, and they were racist, and the Northerners were. I'm exaggerating the point, but she she put a halo around the Northerners and put horns and cloven feet on the Southerners. It was really quite uh, remarkable to see her just snatch that microphone away from uh, Mark uh, Agnell. But there was a couple of uh, specific questions I wanted to get at. One is that Mark Levine of uh, University of Illinois, he is the James G. Randall Professor of History there, which to me is uh, really disappointing because James G. Randall uh, wrote level, unbiased. I mean, uh, there's always some bias, but I mean, his was probably the most objective history of the Civil War that, that uh, I have read. Uh, the last the volume of uh, the last edition of his volume on the Civil War and Reconstruction was done in conjunction with David Donald. And um, I think that was sometime in the 1960s, maybe the early 70s. Excellent. It's excellent and it's, uh, and it's objective. But Mark Levin made the statement that he equated secession with the causes of secession with the causes of the war. In other words, secession equal war. And he uh, belittled states' rights as a as a as a, uh, as a cause. Well, first, with in terms of uh, equating secession with the reasons the Southern soldier fought, I point to a quote by uh, historian uh, Jack Davis, who for many years was with Civil War Times magazine, and uh, has written uh, uh, probably the best biography I've got on Jefferson Davis. But he's not he's not uh, really slanted toward the Confederacy, because I think his most recent book is a uh, comparison of uh, Grant and Lee during the final year of the war. And he comes down in, on the side of Grant being, uh, being the better general. Nonetheless, when uh, in terms of equating the reasons for secessions with the reason why the Southern soldier fought, he rejects that. He said the widespread Northern myth that the Confederates went to the battlefield to perpetuate slavery is just that, a myth. 
their letters and diaries and the tens of thousands reveal again and again that they fought and died because their southern homeland was invaded and their natural instinct was to protect their home and heart. End quote. I think that puts it pretty quite succinctly. Now, I'd like to get at the point that Levine made about equating, uh, about dismissing states' rights as a, uh, as a cause of, uh, of Southern secession. If you look at the Confederate Constitution and compare it to the USA Constitution, obviously there's a lot of similarities, but the points that are different do show that the Confederates were looking for a uh, document a principle that would minimize the power of the central government and optimize and maximize the power of the individual states. That's really quite obvious, and I'll I'll make the I'll make the case here. Um, he he says, well, the only states' rights they wanted to protect was the right to keep their slaves. But if you look at a state's right, it is there's a, a right comes along with responsibilities. And the, it's clear that the Confederate Constitution is putting most of the responsibilities on the states. For example, the, it, uh, under the uh, uh, 1789 Constitution for the United States, the uh, central government was spending money on public works. The Confederate Constitution outlawed that. The USA Constitution also uh, spent money on subsidizing private industry. Confederate Constitution outlawed that. The um, Confederate Constitution also limited the number of things that the central government could spend money on, military defense, repayment of debt, and operating expenses of the, of the government. But Northerners had used the so-called general welfare clause in the USA Constitution to enable the, to enable the federal government uh, to spend money on public works and private industry subsidies and uh, other things like that, Western expansion. The, the Southern, the Confederate Constitution opposed, opposed that. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, public works and private subsidy, private industry subsidies were outlawed. But in addition, they wanted to control spending so the Confederate Congress did not, was not intended to in, uh, normally originate bills. Bills were normally to be originated by the executive, the president, and his uh, staff. If Congress originated a bill, it would have to pass a two-thirds majority in Congress in order for it to become law, and the president would have to sign it. The, um, if the president originated a bill, it would only require 50% vote plus one to become, bill, uh, become an act if, as long as the president signed it. That's one way that uh, it tended to reduce the, the, the power of, of uh, the government to spend money that was not intended. He also had, because you would have, you would have um, pork barrel projects originate in Congress. The president would be less prone to originate them. That's the point. Now, in addition to that, the president in the, of, of the Confederacy had the line item veto, so that if a bill, such as a funding bill for the Confederate Army, uh, included some pork barrel projects, he could eliminate them line by line. He could veto them line by line. Uh, additionally, the um, Confederate uh, Constitution could be could not be uh, amended uh, in a process that begins in Congress. The amendment of the Confederate Constitution would have to come from a convention of the states, but they allowed that as few as three states could organize a convention to propose a, const uh, a constitutional amendment. But I think if you look, if you take all those things into consideration, it, it's pretty clear that the Confederate Constitution wanted to limit the power of the central government. And in that sense, it was clearly a state's rights document. So I think that pretty well summarizes what I want to say today. Again, I would like to show you a copy of my latest book, uh, Causes of the Civil War. Uh, you'll find, you'll find uh, some of the points that I talked about uh, in this book, uh, particularly relating to the differences between 
the federal constitution for the USA and the Confederate constitution. So if you'd like to get a copy of this, at the, it's $22 at Amazon. And if you'd like to get a signed copy, you can contact me and I will charge $25 for it. I will cover the postage and delivery if it's here in the United States. Uh, but you'll get, a, you'll get a signed copy. Just email me, Phil, P-H-I-L, underscore, Lee, L-E-I-G-H, at me, M-E, dot com. Okay, uh, for uh, Civil War Chat, that's our show, and thanks for watching.